I'll tell you something about Mrs. Thatcher which people haven't particularly remarked. She could be extraordinarily brutal and blunt and occasionally rude, but only, only to people who were in a position to fight back. What was your relationship with Mrs. Thatcher, who I guess was the dominant figure under whom you came? Was she suspicious of people like you? Well, <laughs> how, how best to tackle this question? Um, I'm going to interrupt you here because I'm going to I'm going to read from your book because I think this answers this even better than you could right now because you're probably thinking back through the mist of time. I regarded it as my role to tell the Prime Minister what the backbenchers were saying, and I did so. I set out in detail the grumbles that every whip present knew were the views of the mass, vast majority of our backbench colleagues. Margaret did not like the message at all and began to chew up the messenger. I thought her behaviour was utterly unreasonable and I repeated the message. She became more shrill. I'm astonished at what you're saying, she snapped. I made it clear again I was merely reporting the views of members, but she continued to attack me. I became increasingly annoyed and I said, that's what colleagues are saying, whether you like it or not. It's my job to tell you and that's what I'm doing. Her tirade continued. It was an extraordinary performance by the Prime Minister. I have never forgotten it. Then, however, as we rose from the table for post-dinner drinks, her husband Dennis came up to me. She'd have enjoyed that, he remarked, and he drifted off happily, clutching a gin and tonic. So she didn't mind it would you would be suggesting being told what people thought, or did she mind? Well, I didn't know whether she'd mind at all at the time, and frankly, I was so fed up with the way she'd behaved, I didn't much care. But I found out pretty soon, in a pretty spectacular way, that it was easy to misread her. The whips thought I'd blown my career. Several of them said it. And uh, I remember one of them putting his arms around me and said, never mind, she won't be there forever, you can always come back. <laughs> um, but uh, the very next day, I was the whip on duty, sitting on the bench in the House of Commons. When she came from the Prime Minister's office at the back of the Speaker's chair, sat down beside me and said, I've been thinking about what you said last night. We must have another talk about it. I'll convene another meeting. And she did. Mm -hmm. And it was a much gentler meeting. And um, five weeks later, she appointed me a member of her government. So, John, j just to, to return to this bit, give us a sense of the ideological fight in the heart of the Conservative Party from Mrs Thatcher coming in and, the, and what it meant her coming in from 79 to 83, the positives, the negatives. Well, first, if I may say so, it's overdone and was overdone by the media. Of course, she was right of centre in her attitudes and, and many of the others were left of centre, particularly on economic and social matters. There was no question of having a Brexit government with only one conceivable view. She saw these people were talented. She knew she needed a government that brought in the best talent in the Conservative Party and she appointed them. And she was prepared to argue her case and argue with them. I'll tell you something about Mrs Thatcher, which people haven't particularly remarked. She could be extraordinarily brutal and blunt and occasionally rude, but only, only to people who were in a position to fight back. And if they did fight back, she didn't mind. If they didn't fight back, she thought they were wet as a stream. But what I never saw her do was be unkind or brutal to someone who was not in a position to answer back. So she accepted we were a party with a very broad base. And, and on that subject, what, what would she have made of somebody like Boris Johnson deciding to throw out of the party Ken Clark, Nicholas Soames, and, and of course, including me? But what would she thought about the general view that you throw 21 MPs out of the House of Commons because they're, they disagree with you on a no-deal Brexit? Well, I can only tell you that she was Prime Minister for 11 years. She threw nobody out and never even suggested it. And there were certainly plenty of differences. Did you, did you, apart from that exchange that you had with her, in terms of, because if, if you remember the whole sort of, the spitting images had re, a revival. I don't know whether Mrs. Thatcher's still in it, but the image of her sort of, you know, utterly dominant within yeah. the cabinet. What were, no, it's rubbish. What were cabinet discussions actually she, like? Well, they were very blunt. If you, if anybody seriously thinks you're going to stop people like Peter Walker saying exactly what they think in Cabinet, even though it might be diametrically opposed to the Prime Minister, then they didn't know Peter Walker. And if they think Geoffrey Howe would be deterred because he has a gentle manner, then they don't know Geoffrey. And you could say the same about Willie Whitelaw. The belief that Margaret just said, we'll do this and we all do it. It is true that she tended to introduce the subject and at the end of her introduction came her conclusion. <laughs> 
But that is not how the discussions always did, ended. But did she change over time? Did she become more uh, Yes, after, after, after 83 and 87. Well, I wasn't in the cabinet in 83. But after 87, uh, yes, she did. Uh, um, she became a bit more determined to get her own way after 87.